Okay, welcome back everyone. The starting point for this lecture is something I said at the end of last lecture, which is that you should think of the number of vectors in a basis for a subspace V as the dimension of V. So let's remember some of the vocabulary that went into that statement. So if we have a list of vectors, V1 through VK, then their span is all the vectors that are a linear combination of them. <clears throat> and a set of vectors, V1 through VK, is called linearly independent if there's no way to write zero as a linear combination of them other than the trivial way. And we say that V1 through VK is a basis if the Vs span the subspace V and are linearly independent. Um, <clears throat> and notice a subspace can have many different bases. So for example, this drawing is meant to represent the two-dimensional plane x plus y plus z equals zero in R3. Here's some more copies of that same plane. So one basis for that plane would be the vectors 1, negative 1, and 0, 1, negative 1. But another basis would be keep that first vector the same and take my other vector to be 1, 1, negative 2. Another basis would be this funny one with the square roots in it. We'll see why that one is interesting when we hit chapter 5. There are just many, many different ways to take two different vectors which span this plane and are linearly independent. But in every case, we wind up using two vectors. In general, whenever we have a plane, a basis for that plane is two non-proportional non-zero vectors. And whenever we have a line, a basis for that line is a single non-zero vector in that line. <clears throat> And this suggests that the number of vectors in our basis should be called the dimension of the subspace V. And in fact, we are going to define the dimension of a subspace to be the number of vectors in a basis for V. Now, if we're going to make this definition, it had better be true that all these different bases have the same number of vectors in them. So is it clear that that's true? Or could we have a subspace which had one basis with 400 vectors, and another basis with 300 vectors. So <clears throat> you might feel like, well, this is geometrically obvious. Obviously, a line is one-dimensional, a plane is two-dimensional. Obviously, the number of vectors I should use is the dimension. But remember, we want to be able to use these ideas of linear algebra in thousands and thousands of dimensions. And so we want to know that our intuition, which is very good for things in three-dimensional space, is still correct here. So we want to know that this situation does not occur and that, in fact, if you have two different bases, V1 through VP and W1 through WQ of the same subspace, we want to know those bases have the same number of elements in them. So the point of today's lecture is to prove to you that that's true so that the two bases have the, that this fact that any two bases have the same number of vectors in them. And actually, we're going to show a little bit better than that. We're going to show that if V1 through VP span and W1 through WQ are linearly independent, then P is less than or equal to Q. So what you should think about is, <clears throat> in order to span my space, I need at least to mention many vectors. Let me write that down for you. In order to span V, I need at least dimension V many vectors. And I can only fit at most dimension V many linearly independent vectors into V. <clears throat> so this first statement here that P is saying the number of vectors I need to span that's always going to be at least the dimension, and the number of vector and the number of linearly independent vectors I can find is going to be at most the dimension. And so, in particular, 
So in particular, if the V's and the W's are both bases, so that means they're linearly independent and they span, then P is going to be less than or equal to Q, and Q is going to be less than or equal to P, so P will equal Q in that case. So the sentence, so this paragraph down here is a better result than the original one I promised you. And so my goal for this lecture is going to be to establish this paragraph here. This is going to be a little bit more uh, of a proof, a little bit more of a rigorous mathematical argument than we see in a lot of these lectures, but it's a very fundamental fact and you deserve to understand why it's true. Let's understand why it's true. Uh, right, okay, so this says everything I just said. Um, as a consequence of this statement, it does make sense to find a definite the dimension to be the number of vectors, because any two bases have the same number of vectors in them. And if V is a subspace of V1 through VP span, then P is at least dimension V. This is why I said a moment ago, the number of vectors needed to span is at least the dimension. And if I have linearly independent vectors, the number of linearly independent vectors is at most the dimension. Okay, so here in a box at the top of the page is my goal. And I can rewrite this in a logically equivalent way. I'll say if V1 through VP span and W1 through WQ are linearly have Q are some other vectors with Q greater than P, then W1 through WQ are linearly dependent. Right? So instead of proving that yeah, linear independence implies P greater than or equal to Q, I'll show that Q greater than or and P implies linear dependence. So here's a logically equivalent goal in this second box, and that's what I'm going to do. So I just copy that box up here. So since the W's are in the subspace V, and the V's span the subspace V, we must be able to write the W's as a linear combination of the V's. That's what spanning means. And I'll write this out with matrices. Here's a matrix whose columns are the W's. Here's a matrix whose columns are the V's. And A is going to be the matrix of these AIJs. That's a P by Q matrix. Now, so P by Q, that means it is wider than it is tall. So if we row reduce it, there will be a free column, which means that A must have a non-trivial vector in its kernel. So let's let C1, C2, blah, 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 CQ be a non-zero vector in the kernel of A. Then if we multiply out the W matrix times the Cs, well, the W matrix is the V matrix times the As, V matrix times the A's times C, that's V matrix times the zero vector, that's the zero vector. And if we multiply out this left-hand side here, this product of a W matrix by the C's exactly is a linear combination of the W's. So we've shown there's a linear combination of the W's, which is zero. And that was our goal. We get to write the three greatest letters in the English language, QED. Okay, we have achieved our goal. We have finished our proof. We get all these good consequences back here. See you next time.